right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome here. If you're out in the common area and you have not come in yet to join us, I want to invite you to come on in, to grab a seat. We are going to go ahead and stand together and sing. We're going to worship the Lord. Join with us. I hear the Savior sing. Watch and pray, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. here take a moment and say hello to each other uh, give you give your neighbor a wave or a fist bump as you greet each other all right well, you guys can go ahead and have a seat I want to welcome you again here to The Grove. We're so glad you've chosen to, to spend part of your Sunday worshiping with us. Uh, my name is Walter. I am the director of worship here at The Grove. Um, and I want to call your attention. <coughs> I want to call your attention to this. Hopefully you got one of these on your way in uh, program at the back. And I just want to want to pull out a couple of things there that you want to know about. Uh, first of all, there's a connection card. It looks like this on the front. There's a spot for your name and your email address. If you flip it over, there are some next steps on the back, as well as a spot to uh, let us know about any comments or questions you may have, as well as to share prayer requests. We would love to help you get connected here at the Grove and to be able to pray for you. So I'd encourage you uh, to fill out as much of that as you are comfortable. There is also a giving envelope, looks like this, uh, and that is a way for you to help move the mission of the Grove forward financially. If you would like to do that, you can also go to thegrovekc.com, that's our website, and you can give online. And then uh, lastly, I just want to point out the notes, the, the guide for the message that will help you track uh, later on with uh, Pastor Christian as he is speaking. Um, and I'd like to read our call to worship. Uh, let's, let's all stand together. Our, our call to worship comes from Psalm 2113. It says, Be exalted, Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your might. Join us as we continue to worship.
Come now, fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song sung by flame tongues above praise the mountain fixed upon the mount of thy redeeming love here I raise my come before you today from many walks of life. We come before you today of people who need you. We need help. As we cry out to you today that you would bind our wandering hearts to you. Help us not simply to wander but to return to you. Will you speak to us today? Will you open our hearts and minds to receive the truth? Whatever you desire to say to us, pray that you will speak through Pastor Christian as he gives the message. We pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. You can have a seat. Here's a game about climbing up and sliding down. It's called Chutes and Ladders. You can land on something good, like rescuing a kitten in a tree. Ah, you're going up, up, up the ladder. Or land on break the cookie jar. First one to climb to 100 wins. Chutes and Ladders really has its ups and downs, but mostly it's lots of fun. Chutes and Ladders is a Milton Bradley game. Well, good morning again. Welcome to The Grove. If we haven't yet met, my name is Christian. I am the lead pastor, and uh, if we haven't met, man, I would love to get to talk to you, get to chat a little bit after the service. We're going to have some fun in this new series, and we're going to take a look each week at a, a retro commercial, kind of like that. Um, look back at some of the, uh, the most popular family games in recent history. You know, most of us have some kind of history when it comes to playing games as a family, right? Like, for some of us, the mention of family game night, you get super excited. Like, you're ready, you're raring to go, you know, you, we could be doing that right here. And, and if that's you, then I say, hey, you should come to the meetup. There's a meetup Wednesday night. We're going to play some family games. There's going to be a big group, uh, or a group. I don't know how big it will be, but there will be a group playing games on Wednesday night. We'd love to have you. Now, others of you, with the mention of board games or, or family games, uh, you might start 
kind of bristling, right? You might start sort of tensing up a little bit because maybe you've got some history with that. You're like, yeah, you don't know my family. I don't know if you want to want to play games with this group. And if that's you, then I would say you should still come. Come play on Wednesday night. Uh, maybe it'll be different. You can give it a shot. But here's the thing. Either way, games, I, I believe, really serve as a good metaphor for the ways in which we relate in our families. And, and not just how we relate, but some of the difficulties we can face relating well in our families. And so uh, over these next five weeks, whether you are a parent with kids still in the home, you're raising them, you're helping them get ready to become adults, uh, or you're a parent whose kids are already out of the house, or or you're simply just somebody who relates to an extended family, right? In, In some form or fashion, all of us have to relate to family members. So wherever you are on that spectrum, what I want us to remember is we find ourselves playing a variety of games in how we relate to others. Now, sometimes those games are just fine. They can, be, they can be beneficial. But other times, we, we really do face some pretty big difficulties and, and challenges that can cause some frustrations, which brings me back to the reason I, I showed you that Shoots and Ladders commercial. So a little history on the game Shoots and Ladders. It, it was originally known as Snakes and Ladders. So anybody here play Snakes and Ladders at any point? Like, did you know that game, buy that game? Okay, I was like, I think it was even before, like, that's pretty retro, but even before then, there, was, there were games sold as Snakes and Ladders. And the, the belief is that that game has its history uh, in India, goes way, way back, hundreds of years, in India, and it was created as a way to help teach counting and to help reinforce virtuous living of some form. So snakes and ladders, the snakes actually stood for evil. Okay, they were meant to represent evil. And this idea that when you, uh, when you took a misstep uh, in terms of behaving properly, that would send you backwards, sliding down. And then the ladders stood for virtue. So the idea being that if I, I take virtuous steps, if I do things that are good and right, then that will help uh, elevate me, help put me in a better spot. Now, even in its current form, right, now we, we don't play with snakes and ladders, just shoots, not quite as dangerous, um, but, you know, if you're playing on those old metal playgrounds with the really hot metal slides, then that can be pretty dangerous. But, but regardless, shoots and ladders, when we, we talk about its current version, it, it illustrates well that in life there are some things that tend to accelerate us, that, that tend to propel us forward. We take certain steps and we find, man, that went a lot easier than I I really even could have expected. But then there are also things, there are steps that we take in life that we find ourselves tripping up. And and those things send us back, and and we're covering territory that we've already been through and we didn't want to uh, go through again. So we just end up kind of circling around, and and we find ourselves going, man, this is really familiar, and I didn't like it the first time, and I certainly don't want to have to go through it a second, third, fourth, fifth, however many times. But that's the way life goes. And and that's the way we can, again, find ourselves in families and the way we're uh, relating. And and what's interesting about Shoots and Ladders, personally, I remember loving Shoots and Ladders at a certain point as a kid, like thinking, oh, this is really cool. Like you get to climb up these ladders and then you're shooting down and counting. Yeah, I like math. That was really cool. And then at some point, I grew up to a spot where I was like, This game has no strategy whatsoever. Like, it doesn't matter what I do, I can't get ahead, right? So the competitive juices kick in. It's like, this makes no difference to me. So so that in itself was frustrating. But again, when you find yourself playing this game, realize that the way the game is set up, it's mathematically unlikely, but it is possible that you could play shoots and ladders and never actually get to 100. You, you could just, the, the spin of the wheel could keep landing you on these, la- on these shoots that are sending you backwards, and you would constantly just find yourself treading up, making your way, almost getting there, only to find yourself back close to start, or, or again, covering territory you've already been through. And so there's this problem, right, that, that it can be incredibly frustrating, not just to play shoots and ladders, but incredibly frustrating when it comes to relating well in our families. Because again, we find ourselves covering ground that we've already been through, going, man, why are we here again? Why is this this thing that's going on and on and on? And and that's the experience that we're going to look at today and throughout this series. There are some games that we play in family life that, for all practical purposes, just send us back to the start. They send us back to to have to do this thing again and again, and, and it becomes 
wearying. We, we don't want to have to live that kind of existence. But here's the thing. God really does offer us a way, not just forward, but a way that when we, when we really embrace his ways, when rightly understood, some ways that can actually save us a lot of heartache. And so that's what we're going to look at. I want to start out by looking at really where these, what I'll call unhealthy family dynamics come from. Okay, what, what is the root of these dynamics? And what we find is that unhealthy family dynamics actually have an ancient source. Okay, there's an ancient source to these unhealthy, frustrating family dynamics. In my opinion, the Bible offers the most viable explanation of why we experience frustration in life, whether it's families or just in, in any number of things. And I want us to see where that frustration starts. So you have the first couple, Adam and Eve. God creates this man and this woman, and he has this grand plan that really they would be a representative of his family on the earth. And he creates the earth as, as really, in, in many ways, a gift to them. It's meant to be enjoyed by them. It's meant to be stewarded, to, to be taken care of by them. And the plan is that as they are fruitful and multiply, just as all of creation was created to be fruitful and multiply, that what will happen is they will be helping create a family for God. Not because he's needy, not because there's something lacking in himself, but because out of love he's decided, this is what I want to do. I, I, want to, to, I want my love to overflow into creating humans. And I want them to then continue this mission. I want them to embrace this, this good life that I've given them. The problem is that they rebel. They rebel against God, and they're found out by him. You, you can't sneak around your creator, okay? I mean, that's just the, the facts. The one who created you knows you, and nothing is hidden from him. And so you can't sneak around. It was a bad idea then. It's a, a ba bad idea now. And the consequences of their rebellion, which we call sin, the Bible calls sin, the con consequences were frustration in marriage relationships and families, and then toil in our work, right? I, I was telling somebody this morning, I, I'd worked on preparing this message, and I got here, and I've been using kind of a different software to, to type out my messages, and I discover, hey, a whole section of what I'd worked on is gone. It's just not there. It didn't, didn't get saved. Don't know why, just wasn't saved. So, okay, back to the drawing board, right? That's the kind of frustration we face in any number of things. That's part of the toil that we deal with in our work. But this goes back to this incident in the Garden of Eden where God addresses this rebellion that, that our first grandparents had perpetrated. Here's what God says. God is speaking here in Genesis 3, 16 to 18, and he's addressing the man and the woman. He said to the woman, I will intensify your labor pains. You will bear children with painful effort. Your desire will be for your husband, yet he will rule over you. And he said to the man, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, do not eat from it. The ground is cursed because of you. You will eat from it by means of painful labor all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. So Again, here we find ourselves in this frustration that happens in relationships, toil and frustrating work that happens as we endeavor to do any number of things. We're not just an agrarian society anymore, so it, it, this, this problem plays out in any number of things that we do. And, and there's, a, there's a reason for this frustration. I'm going to get to that in a second, but frustration in families and in life, um, they're just a part of our experience. Like, all of us can, can say, yeah, I've been, I mean, I get frustrated. Like, there are things that just don't go the way I wish they would go, and that is frustration, frustrating. And, and really, this is the source of these unhealthy family dynamics, okay? There are much more we could talk about there, but I just, just want to establish that, that as we approach this idea of, of family dynamics and how families should relate, Let's understand that there is frustration here, and it's built in. It's a result of this rebellion. And again, there's a reason, there's even a good reason for the frustration, and I'll talk about later, but this is the source of that unhealthy family dynamic. But let's look more deeply at what goes on as we attempt to relate rightly as families. Just, just what does it mean when we talk about family dynamics? So every family, just like a game, is a system. And I'm going to use a few different uh, analogies here. I want you to track with me. I'm going to do my best to make sure you're, it's clear where we're going and, and what we're looking at here. But, but I want us to see that every family, 
like a game, is a system. What do I mean? What's a system? That sounds so formal, right? That doesn't sound very loving and warm, right? We're just, we're in a system, okay? So what are we talking about here? Well, understand this. A, a, a system, just by definition, is a number of things connected together as a whole. A number of things connected together as a whole. We have a lot of examples of a system. We can just look into creation and see the way systems work. So, so you talk about creation. There is a solar system, and you probably did that thing in elementary school where you had to go get the foam balls and some wire and spray paint and maybe other materials, depending on how much your parents helped you do this thing. And, and you put together the solar system and you saw how the planets relate to one another and how they relate to the sun and, and how this all goes together. So I, I can understand something about Earth just by studying Earth, but if I really want to know more about Earth, I have to see it in, as a part of this larger whole. And the same is true when we talk about an ecosystem. Right? Different parts of creation working together, water and land and animals and vegetation. These things work together. Photosynthesis, right? There's, there's this system. So we can understand one part of it, but to really understand the whole, we have to see how they relate to one another. And then we can go to body systems, right? Our bodies have a, lo- a number of systems. Skeletal system, uh, skin system, there's a better word for that. I'm not remembering right now. But right, there, there's these different systems, our cardiovascular system. There's all these things that, that go on in our bodies. In fact, there's a, a good example of how these systems relate that is, I think, helpful as we talk about family. In biology, there's a term known as homeostasis. I'm just going to read this definition. It is the state of steady internal, physical, and chemical conditions maintained by living systems. So here's an example. Your body temperature is an example of homeostasis, right? We all know if you are healthy, your body temperature should be what? 98.6. Okay, good. You guys paying attention to something in elementary school and all that? Okay, good. Parents, right? You know how to take care of your kids. And, and, and here's what we know. We know when homeostasis is out of whack. How do we know? We get a fever, right? We, we, we start to feel warm. Or we, I mean, it's less likely or less often, but, you know, if our body temperature gets low, we, we also know, hey, there's a problem here. So we know that healthy is 98.6. This, the system is working the way it's supposed to work. And the same is true in our families. These are relational systems. And the same is true in the games that we play. These things work together. I can't just hold up a game board and go, here, everything you need to know about the game is just on this game board. If there's more that goes on. There's, there's pieces to the game. As we're going to see, there are rules to the game. There are different parts to this game. It's a system. It works together. And as I've said, the individual parts, here's the thing. We don't minimize the individual things. The same is true in all of creation. The individual parts have a certain uniqueness, dignity, beauty. They they have a certain purpose. And that is not uh, amplified necessarily or taken away from because they're a part of a system. In fact, I would say it is amplified. But it's it's not degraded. It's not taken down. Just because they say, oh, here's this individual and they're part of something bigger doesn't mean I'm taking away from the individual. There are some systems, there are some systems of thought that, that attempt to do that. But biblically, what we're saying is, no, I can be a part of something larger than me, and it doesn't take away my, my dignity, it doesn't take away my uniqueness, it actually enhances it. So that's what we want to look at, is we want to be able to understand not only ourselves, but understand what does it look like for us to relate together as families. And to do that, we need to realize these are a system. Again, like a game. And so every family, like a game, is a system. And it consists of a few things. And we could talk about others, but just for the sake of analogy, here's here's three things that I think are really important as we think about both games and our families. First, every family consists of rules. Every game consists of some kind of rules. This is how we, how the game is played. A, A game is created. It may be, you know, it can be a game that you buy off the shelf, or it can be a game that you make up. Right? My kids love Calvin Ball, right? Just this imaginary game created by the, the author of Calvin and Hobbes. Okay, so you can create stuff, but still there are rules. E- even if the rules are, there are no rules. There's some kind of rule, right? There's some way that the game is played. And, and just as there is a healthy body temperature, again, there's a certain way that the game is to be played. And there's a certain way that families are intended to function. Okay, biblically, there's a certain way that, ta- that families are intended to function. And I'll talk more on that here in a bit. But as we all know, not everyone actually plays the game the same way. 
And on the one hand, that's fine. There, there, are certain, there is meant to be, again, a diversity. There, there's uniqueness. Not, just as there are with people, there's uniqueness in our families. This is not a cookie-cutter approach. Not every family has to work the same way, okay? And that's fine. We, we can play things a, a little bit different, which brings us to the second component of this system. There's an atmosphere. It's how we play the game, right? There are rules of how the game should be played, but then there's how we play the game. Now, families sometimes modify the game. They sometimes take the rules and they, they do a little bit different, and, and that's fine. Okay, it's kind of the same, but different. We, we learned this recently. Uh, we play the, the alphabet game. You go on road trips, right, playing the alphabet game. And for us, there are certain rules when you're playing the alphabet game. The driver gets certain privileges because they're the driver and they're supposed to be focused on, you know, not just getting, you know, competing. They're supposed to be actually driving. Okay, so the driver gets certain things. And, and then there's certain rules in terms of what, what is fair game, you know, to find the letters. You know, can we look at license plates? Can we look at the cars going by? Do we only have to look at billboards? Can we look at the, the signs that the state puts up? You know, there's all these different rules. But just recently, my kids were, were traveling with some other folks on a little bit longer drive, and they, one of them learned, well, this family plays this game very differently. Like, their rules are, are much more lax. Like, we're, like, kind of hardcore. We didn't realize it. Like, we're hardcore in terms of how we play the alphabet game. So there, there's a different way that these things get played. Every family has a different approach to the game. Some of you, if we bust out shoots and ladders out here, right, it's cutthroat. You're like, dude, I'm spinning this thing, and I'm hoping, and, I'm, and while you're spinning, I'm hoping you're landing on that, that shoot. Like, go back, because I'm going to be the first to 100. It's cutthroat. And then others of us, like, you play games for, th- like, this weird thing. You play games for fun. Like, you, you just, <laughs> just want to have fun and, and play a board game. It's the, the strange thing, but it happens, right? I, I've heard this is the kind of thing that happens. And so, you know, we play shoots and ladders. You're like, oh, I don't care. Yeah, I've been stuck on three for the whole time, but that's okay. You got to 100. Great, good, good, good. Okay, so there's a different way that we play the game. And that's just that there's a different atmosphere in how you approach game playing. And the same is true for relating to one another. Different families have a different atmosphere. They have a different way of playing the game. And I want to note, right, just like there are varied versions of the alphabet game, once again, there is a certain diversity that's okay. It's not just okay, it's actually beautiful. So, so you know, that, that's fine, that's good. And, and, and again, just as individuals have a certain uniqueness, beauty, dignity, and purpose, different combinations of individuals produce families with their own uniqueness, beauty, dignity, and purpose. But because of that ancient seed of dysfunction, There are ways that we all engage in relationships that do more harm than good. We've got to recognize that. There there are ways that we relate that they actually do more harm than good. And what happens because of that is when the family system, someone in the family system, tries to step outside of the way we play, there's there's consequences, right? I mean, if if you're, you're kind of that... You're part of that cutthroat game-playing family, and all of a sudden you, you turn just, you know, like, hey, no, I just want to have fun. Everybody goes, whoa, 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 no, no, that's not how we do things here, right? There's a way that we do this. And the same is true in families. There's, a, there's this temperature, there's this atmosphere. And when you try to, to change that, people respond. They're not always happy, right? When, when you start to, to look at something, go, what if we did it a different way? There's, there's feedback. There's something that, that comes and, and deals with that, which gets us to the third piece, okay, which is the feedback loop. There's a feedback loop, which is how you keep the game on track. This is true of how we play games, right? If you start to break the rules, and people rightly, they go, whoa, 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 you can't do that. That's not allowed. You don't get to just, you know, hop from ladder to ladder like that. There's no hopping in shoots and ladders. That's, that's not how this works. You got to follow the path. And so there's a feedback loop, and the same is true in our families. When we, you know, when the goal of the family becomes to just kind of keep the status quo, and somebody deviates from that, then there's feedback. People respond to that. They deal with that. Sometimes that that feedback loop is pretty harsh. Like, whoa, 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 you're part of this family. That's not how we do it. And and again, though, here's the thing. Feedback loop is not in itself bad. There are times when we step out of bounds, and it's good that people would come and go, hey, look, that's not how we're supposed to do things. Come, come back. Let, let's keep on doing this. But when, you're, when you know, hey, this is dysfunctional. This isn't helpful. This is harming us. And you try to fix that. It's not always welcome. It's not always met, met with enjoyment. 
There, there's that feedback loop that comes and kind of snap you back into it. No, no, no. We're going to operate this way. And again, the dysfunction just continues on and on. The frustration continues. Again, this is where I'm reminded of playing shoots and ladders, right? I mean, you, you, you find yourself moving along. You're, you, you maybe even take some steps to, to make things better, to relate more rightly. And, and you're making progress, and then all of a sudden, and you find yourself, you've landed on a shoot. You've landed on this slide, and it's taking you back. You're like, here we are again. Man, I thought we were, I thought this was better. I thought I was going to, I just wanted to, you know, try to be not quite so volatile in the way we were going to relate. But man, here we are again, just yelling at each other, upset about this thing or that thing. Just, just almost back to start. Again, incredibly frustrating to keep walking the same path over and over. A- and it's easy to lose heart when you do this because it seems like things are never going to change. Right? It, the feedback loop kicks in to keep you relating the same way, and just you, you do it again and again, stuck in these unhealthy family dynamics. And you're forced to relate the way the family relates, and if you don't, you pay for it. Again, it becomes frustrating. And so here's the thing. God wants to guide us out of this kind of frustration. In fact, while God, you know, he, he deals with the rebellion— by saying, here's going to be the result, is frustration. What he's actually doing is he's, he, he's built frustration into our world in order not to, to just do damage to us. In fact, what he wants to do is let that frustration drive us back to him. To realize what our first grandparents didn't realize or, or, or lost sight of, which was we really need our creator. We need the Lord God to guide us. We need him in this world. He's created us to need him. And so that frustration, again, is so that we would turn to him for his help. It's this feedback loop, okay, designed to help us. Now, a feedback loop designed to keep us unhealthy is unhelpful. But the feedback loop itself is not a bad thing. We need to know when we're off track. And God wants to meet us in our frustration and help us learn how to have healthy family dynamics. And so what does that look like? How how do we relate helpfully? What what I want us to know is God provides help for healthy family dynamics, but before we get into that, I want to define something, right? We we use that term healthy. Again, what we're talking about here is not a one-size-fits-all approach to family. There's a diversity. That's fine. Instead, what we're seeking here is something healthy rather than the unhealthy patterns that we fall into. And, And the problem is that we have a lot of uh, different ideas of what healthy means. Here, I, when I asked you what's a healthy body temperature, we all know, oh, 98.6. But what's a healthy family temperature? What's a healthy family climate? What does that look like? And, and so to help us just get a, a little bit of understanding of that, I, I want to introduce you to a, a friend of mine. We've adapted this series from our, our friends and partner church, the Church in the Valley in Ontario, California. They're a part of the 17.6 network that we're also a part of. And so we've adapted this series that they've already done. And I want you to hear from Nathan Lewis, who is a longtime member of Church in the Valley. Um, he's going to explain his definition of healthy families. You say, well, why are you asking this random guy from California to tell us? Well, well, here's who Nathan is. Okay, Nathan is the director of the grad program in counseling ministry at California Baptist University. He has well over 30 years of experience in trying to help families move forward and develop healthy, uh, you know, be able to, to move toward being fully functional. Um, I've benefited greatly from his counsel. Sarah and I, we've known him and his wife, Tina, for, I don't know, over 15 years. Uh, and they've been a real help to us in our marriage. They've been a help to us as parents in understanding just what does it look like to relate in a healthy manner. So listen to, to Nathan describe what we're talking about when we say healthy. When we talk about a healthy family, we're really talking about a, a relational environment. Uh, kind of a culture that, that the members of the family experience as they relate to each other. So a healthy family is a family where members are relating to each other in a way that it, it fosters the right kind of growth in the family members and the strengthening of the family. And if if they re- relate uh, rightly with each other, 
then that creates the right kind of environment for the right things to happen. So it, it's, it's used as a metaphor, but it, uh, that, that really is specifically about how we relate to each other. And the other thing, the other metaphor that helps with that is just the environment. So I, I grew up in, in Orange County and before they began to clean the air, we actually had smog days where uh, the air got so bad, the air quality got so bad, we couldn't breathe. And I mean, I had just trouble breathing and they would cancel school based on smog days. And families are just like that. There, there's an environment, there's the air that we breathe relationally. It's either healthy or it's not healthy. It either fosters growth or it impedes growth. So when we talk about being healthy, God really wants to help us. And, and God, uh, help, his help starts with embracing two ideas related to our families. We're going to look at this again over the next many weeks. But two ideas I want us to see today related to our families. One is let God's word rule family life. Okay? Let God's word rule family life. God in his world, word reveals the way out of damaging dynamics. What we find as we, we turn to God's Word, when we turn to the Bible, is that it shows us what godliness looks like in relationships. And by, by godliness, I mean a God-referenced way of living, a way that says, no, no, God really is at the center. He's the one who defines reality. He's created everything. He's the one that defines reality. So my reality, my living, needs to relate to Him first and, let, and then flow out of that. And so that's what we find as we turn to his word is that he's helping us understand who he is and what life looks like when he is at the center of everything. And, and, and so as he does that, um, we, he will lead us away from ungodliness if we follow his ways. This is the way Jesus talked about this. This, was, this is what Jesus in, in coming, uh, this is part of what he was setting the stage for and wanting us to really understand. And, and he tells us how to build your house, so to speak. Really he's saying your life. Listen to what he says in Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27. He makes this comparison. He says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell, the, the rivers rose, and the winds blew and pounded that house. Yet it didn't collapse because its foundation was on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and doesn't act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, the rivers rose, the winds blew and pounded that house, and it collapsed. It collapsed with a great crash. The accepted definition of a dysfunctional family is that they cannot handle the everyday stresses of life. Okay, that, that's just kind of this accepted definition. They cannot handle the everyday stresses of life. And here Jesus compares houses, okay, lives, and by extension our families, who can handle the stresses of life and those who can't. And, and I want you to understand a little background here. Th this teaching comes at the end of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus has been teaching this amazing, just counter-cultural, counter to the religious culture uh, explanation of just what life in his kingdom is all about. And here at the tail end, he makes this comparison. But what he's getting at, okay, the, the illustration here is he would have been teaching this, Sea of Galilee would have been in the backdrop of, of him teaching. And what you need to know is that at the Sea of Galilee, the sand around that sea in the summertime gets really, really hard. You, you may have been in areas where this is the case, right? The, the sand gets super hard. And so on first examine, when I mean, you just look at it, you think, oh, hey, this is solid. This is great. I'm going to build my, my house here because this, this is rock hard. It's going to be really difficult. So I'll just, this is a good enough foundation. We'll just, you know, put this house up and we'll be in good shape. But the problem is, that sand, while it may look hard in the summertime, when the rains come, it, it just turns to mud. And, and so instead what Jesus is saying, no, no, you've got to go below the surface. You've you got to go deeper to something that may not have been as obvious, doesn't seem as easy, but is where real life is found. You go down to the bedrock, and that's where you're able to build a life that will last. And he says that life is found in, in knowing and obeying my words. See, our approach to life may seem good enough, but the storms come to reveal how secure it really is. 
And, and if we learn to read and study and listen to God's word taught and allow God to change us through it, what happens is we grow strong in handling the stresses of life. You'll be able to withstand the storms of life because your house is built on a strong foundation. Now, it doesn't mean the storms don't come. Catch that. This is not, I mean, this kind of Christianity that gets peddled where it says, oh, just trust God, man, everything's going to be great. That's not, that's not the way this works. Christ followers, we're subject to the same storms everybody else is. What it means is we have a foundation that allows us to weather that. And, and that foundation is, is not just God's word, it's God himself helping us walk through those things. He doesn't abandon us in the storm and say, good luck, hope you, hope you were reading. No, he's with us, helping us. If you hear his words, though, and you don't put them into practice, what happens is your house just crashes under the stress. It crashes in the storm. And so I want to encourage you, allow God's word to set the standard for your family life. Let God's word rule in your family life. This has been incredibly helpful for me. Begin to read and study and listen, again, to the Bible being taught in order to put it into practice. It's been incredibly helpful to me. I mean, helpful all the time. Often, as I get into Scripture for myself, God speaks. He reveals a pattern that I need to change. He, he reminds me of things that I already know. I said, why do I have to be reminded? Well, because I'm hard-headed. <laughs> I mean, just, there's reason, but... But he reminds me, and I go, oh, God, that's what that's about. That's why this has been so difficult. Because I'm not actually doing what you've already said. It can be easier. It's not easy, but it can be easier. And as God speaks to us, as he reveals stuff, whether it's, it's through our own reading, it's through the Bible being taught, what happens is I respond to that. God helps me. He, he speaks to me and gives me this choice to make. Either I will obey him or I, not, I will not. Obedience is a path to blessing. It's not how we get on God's good side. Obedience flows out of already knowing that in Jesus we can be on God's good side. And then he wants to just help us to carry out the things that he's intended for us. Jesus says that a, a strong foundation for families grows from hearing his words and putting them into practice. And as you do this, you'll find there's still a great diversity and freedom in our life together. But there, but there is also one common element that is to show up in our relationships. Okay, here's the thing. You, you follow God's word. It doesn't mean all of us, you know, we all eat breakfast at the same time, lunch at the same time, dinner at the same time. All of our lives need to look exactly the same. That's not what's going on. But it begins to reshape around these different, this different way of living. And there, but there is to be a common atmosphere, a common element that shows up in all our relationships. And so that's the second thing. Let God's love set the temperature for your home. Let God's love set the temperature for living. Jesus has his core characteristic for all of his followers, and that is love. And you may hear that. You say, well, duh. I mean, who, come on. I didn't have to come to church. I didn't have to get up this morning you know, earlier than I would have wanted on a Sunday and, and, and to come here to hear somebody else tell me, families are supposed to love one another, right? I mean, we've got the sign on our wall, live, love, laugh. Like, we know we're supposed to do that. Like, this is not brain science. Like, we, we understand this, okay? I say, you're right. I get that. But, but I would ask you, I mean, this is a, a, another, a question for another sermon another time, but why do we know that, first of all? Why do we know that that's how families are supposed to relate? What, what tells us that that's the way that's supposed to happen? Okay, again, different time, different sermon. But more importantly, what do we mean by love? Because Jesus spells love, S-A-C-R-I-F-I-C-E. He spells it sacrifice. I want you to hear this. John 13, 34 to 35, he, he tells his disciples, he tells all of us, I give you a new command, love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. He says, wait, a new command? This love idea, I mean, it's been around for a long time, Jesus. What are you talking about? He says, no, no, this is the new part. Just as I have loved you. In other words, I'm going to set the pattern for what love fully looks like. And without me in the middle of it, you, that love falls short of what I'm commanding you. So how did Jesus love his disciples? Well, when he gave this command to love as he loved in John, in John 13, it's the night before he died. Now the next day he sacrificed his own life 
to pay for our sins on the cross. He, he died because that ancient rebellion didn't stop with our first ancient grandparents. It continues through time to every single one of us. Our dysfunction starts with that rebellion. And so Jesus lays down his life to redeem us. That is to, to bring us back into the fold, bring us back into God's family. But in the moment that he gave this command, Jesus did something else that was really instructive. He washes the disciples' feet. At the moment, he's telling them about this. I mean, he's just washed the disciples' feet. And we've talked about this before, right? I mean, not wearing loafers, not wearing Nikes. We're, we're talking sandals on dusty roads, no asphalt, no concrete, dusty roads, miles at a time, no other vehicles. So we're, we're walking everywhere, every day we're walking. These are dirty, nasty feet. This is what the servants did. You paid somebody who just couldn't do much else to, to wash people's feet as a, a sign of hospitality, a courtesy. Jesus says, no, no, no. I will go to the, whatever lowest place you think that is, and I will show you, because I, I, I'm already, I'm going to show you tomorrow, but I'm going to show you right now what it looks like to love, to lay down your life for others. This was the practice, again, of common servant. And so he sends this message loud and clear. Jesus, this is the message he wants us to know. When my followers see needs around them, they take initiative to meet them out of love. And that starts in our homes. It's got to start there. So, oh, I can love that, my coworker, but, you know, my spouse, ugh, can't do that. That doesn't make any sense. It starts inward. I mean, it starts with the most precious relationships and is to work its way out. Now, things get awry. Things go wrong. We have to figure out how do we relate, but, but that's where it, it, it needs to start. We, we need to learn to sacrifice. So love, like healthy, is another word that can get filled with lots of different meanings, but love in the biblical sense that Jesus used here is doing what's best for someone, regardless of how you feel. So th this is this unique kind of love that finds its source in God alone. It's a supernatural love that must be drawn from him. And if this kind of love sets the temperature in our homes, the whole family can thrive there. Here's the most practical definition of love. It won't be that unfamiliar to us. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interests, but rather to the interests of others. Okay. Selfish ambition, I'm just going after what I want to go after. I go after me. I, I'm doing what's best for me. Instead, what we are to do is not be me first people, but us first people, okay? We've we got to get past ourselves to serve others, to serve the people around us. In the Grove, we, we practice what we call hard attitudes. This is just us trying to, to summarize. What, what does Jesus say about how we should relate as a, a church family? And hard attitude number one is just putting this, this definition in, in practice, Philippians 2, 3 through 4. Put the goals and interests of others above my own. But when this, when this kind of love shows up in our families, when it shows up in our churches, man, it makes a huge difference. When, when things go awry, when I start looking out just for me, man, the, the things, they're just not good. They break down. All kinds of frustration happens. Now, in the short term, it can be frustrating. Oh, I got to go do something for somebody else. But in the long run, what happens is, man, there's, there's a sweetness that atmosphere, you can breathe. It's not that heavy feeling like Nathan was describing. Of, I mean, I lived in smog for a long time with asthma. I know what that's like. But man, the air gets lighter when, when people are actually loving one another, serving one another. And this is what God wants for us. As we learn to relate this way, it, it really does make family dynamics grow healthier over time. And so parents... Again, you, especially with kids in the home, set a, a godly temperature in your home. You, you know this. I mean, you have to do this. There, there's times with your kids you have to. There's, there's no choice. You have to put their goals and interests ahead of your own. There are other times where you really do have to make a choice. And God calls us to kind of set this temperature. But if you're sitting here and you're like, you know, this sounds interesting. I don't know. I don't know about this. I'm not sure I've experienced this kind of love that Jesus is describing. 
I'm not sure I've understood that, that what he did on that cross thousands of years ago was for me. I want to just invite you. Today can be a day where, where you, could, you could really understand that for yourself. That, that I, I hope this message would give you a sense of where he would lead you in the future. The frustration in your immediate or extended family relationships or with friends or at work, those are meant to draw you to the Lord. He wants to draw you to himself. And so I, I encourage you, seek the Lord and ask him to help you develop healthy relationships. As we close, I, I want to point to the extra handout that you got there in your program. Again, this is meant especially for the families who have kids in the home, but grandparents, maybe kids are around. This is something you could do with them. Just some practical ideas, just a, a couple things to think about in your families, a summary of the message and some ways to apply it and have some fun. And then I'd like to invite you to, to come back and be a part of the rest of this series. I think it's going to be helpful to you. I, I, it's helping me as I'm going back through these things and being reminded, oh yeah, this is the way I'm supposed to be doing this. But then also in that program is a card, an invite card. And I, I would encourage you, again, our, our home crowd, you call the Grove Home. Who's one person, one family, one friend that you could, uh, that you could give that to? And say, hey, you know, if, it's on, if you're honest, you know, hey, I think this, this would be helpful. This first message, you know, gave me some things to think about. W- would you come with me? I'd love to have you join me at church, and, and maybe this would be an encouragement to you. We'd love for you to use that. Pass that along. Invite somebody to come back and be a part of the rest of the series. God's word on families blesses and guides. And I hope we will continue to recognize that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you that we could be together and spend this time looking into your word. I pray for each member of a family that is here. All of us are a part of a family in some form or fashion. I pray that you would help us to seek you in your word and that we begin to or continue to seek to put the goals and interests of others ahead of our own. That is a a supernatural act. I pray that you would work powerfully in us and help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
be facing something today that seems impossible in your family. God can make a way, because that's who he is. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Because Jesus has made a way. We have joy because he has given us new life. Um, we, we've chosen to follow Jesus so we, we can rejoice. We can sing wherever we go. I want to invite you to join us as we sing our last song. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul.
to my soul, mountain high, valley low, I'm going to sing wherever I go. Hey, thanks guys. Before we wrap up, I want to say first off, thank you. A number of you came and helped us yesterday at Kids Fest. We had a great time. Got to hang out with lots of different families. Uh, they threw paper airplanes. I want you to see a few of the pictures of, uh, there was our set up there and getting to interact with families that made paper airplanes. We helped run a uh, egg race and a sack race and uh, it was hot. It was very hot. Uh, but we gave away popsicles as well. And so really a deep, deep gratitude to all of you that came out and helped us do that. Uh, we had a, a great opportunity to interact with the city and continue to forge that relationship. And so uh, really a good time was had by a lot of people. And so thank you for being a part of that. Um, let's see. With that, we're going to, no, oh, one other thing. I want to invite you. So we're going to throw another party. Block Back to School Bash coming up Friday, August 20th. Uh, we're going to do that here in our parking lot. The last time we threw one of those back in June, uh, we had a bunch of folks up from Texas to help us run it. Uh, this time we're going to do it, and we're going to run it. And so we'll, you'll be hearing more about ways that you can pitch in and help us do that. It's a Friday night, uh, and we're hoping that'll be a great opportunity for us to connect with more folks in this uh, community that we love. And so uh, stay tuned for that, but, but we'd love for you to mark your calendars and make plans to be a part of it one way or another. As we pray, as we have done in the past, we're going to continue to pray for um, just wanting to see the gospel spread through the, the partnerships that we have in other churches and uh, in other connections and ministries and different things. But we also take time at different points throughout the month. Uh, we pray for vocation, just the idea that, hey, our work is part of extending the kingdom of God. And today what I want to do is pray uh, for our retired folks, for those of you who are retired, um, because you're, you may be retired from the, the job that you had, but your vocation in the kingdom doesn't cease. And so let me pray for us as we wrap up and uh, we'll, we'll continue on. Father, we do thank you uh, for the folks in our family, in this church community, uh, who have been able to um, walk through that season of uh, employment where they were having to, to, to go to work every day uh, in, in some form or fashion. We thank you for the, the work that they did, the good work that they were able to be a part of. And we thank you that they've come to a point in life where uh, that's not necessary, but you have still provided for their needs, and they've been able to now enter into a new season. We pray that as they do that, as they, they fill their days, that uh, their eyes would be set on you, that you would help give them guidance and, and insight on how best to make use of the time, um, and that you would work powerfully in and through them, encourage them when maybe not having that job can be uh, hard. And I pray that you would, again, give them great understanding of what you have for them in this season of life as well. We're grateful for them, the many ways that they pitch in and help make uh, this community go and grow. Uh, we pray your blessings upon those folks. And I ask this in the name of Jesus. And with that, may the love of the Father, may the grace of Jesus, his Son, and the comfort and encouragement of the Holy Spirit be with you now. And until Jesus comes back, he's coming back at some point. Uh, you guys have a fantastic week. We'll see you next time.